We respectfully request the Sangha great virtues for the sake of this assembly and all living beings. Please turn the wonderful Dharma wheel to teach and guide us how to end birth and death, leave suffering and attain bliss, and quickly realize non-birth. Vì thứ pha hồi cấp nhờ thiết chúng sanh Tình chuyến diệu pha luôn Giáo đạo ngã mùng Như há liệu sanh thoát từ ly khổ đà là tất chứng vô sanh. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto sute do ye ola hodi san miao san puto se. Nam mô Tát Đạt Tha Tô Giả Đa Giả A La Hà Đệ Tam Miệu Tam Bồ Đà Tọa. The unsurpassed, profound, subtle, and wonderful Dharma in a hundred thousand million eons is difficult to encounter. Now that I am able to see and hear, I will receive and maintain it. I vow to fathom the thus come one's true and actual principles. O Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, Great Master Ching Liang, Great Master Shen Hua, O good monks and nuns, and all good knowing advisors of me, Tovo. Hello everyone, today is the 25th of February 2024. We're here in Wei Mountain to continue discussing the first chapter of the Avatamsaka Sutra. Thank you all for coming. Uh, uh, the uh, now in, in the section, this is a chapter about world rulers. This is an introduction of who's who in the universe. So the mere fact you're hearing about these names is incredible for you. It generates incredible blessings. On top of it, we also are explaining to you, giving you more insights into how they got there and what they're about. Here we're in a section where he's, he's going through the, the, uh, the, the heaven, the heavenly king rulers. So this is we into the fourth desire heaven uh, in our desire realm. Our desire realm has six heavens. We went through the first, the number six, number five already. Now it's number four, or the Tushita heaven, or the heaven of contentment. As the name indicates, in these heavens here, the heavenly blessings are very, very happy. They're so content. They don't need anything else. Okay? They have things, everything they want. And whatever they want, I mean, they're very content with it. They have very few desires. Okay? Because all the desires are met. 
and they learn to be happy with what they have. So if they're driving a Toyota, which is the same as Mercedes, they're happy. The Toyota, Mercedes, same thing. Okay? You got that? All right. That's who they are. Let's go into it. 512. Moreover, celestial king contentment, gain a passage into liberation of encountering the turning wheel of the wheel of perfect teaching each time a Buddha appears in the world. 五次, Mm. Okay. So the leader mm, of these celestial kings, the most influential one, is by the, the name of Celestial King, King Contentment. You see, he's very happy. It's amazing. When you're happy, you become a leader in this heaven because this heaven here is about knowing contentment. And he's, he says, I'm about contentment. No, no one knows more about contentment than me. Okay? So what is contentment? He's always happy, never worried. Okay? Uh, how? By getting rid of thoughts of greed, anger, and stupidity. That's how you become happy and never worried. When you think about it, why aren't we happy in our world? Because uh, we still have greed, we still have anger, we still have delusions. Hmm? We have, uh, and yet we still desire for more. Huh? And then we have a tendency of pissing people off. Okay? Uh, Mm. And in a way, it's our release, by the way. Anger is a form of release for us. It's very important that we get angry so that we can release it, the, the chi of anger, the anger energy, and dump it on someone else. It has an equalizing effect. So if I are you angry, since I have uh, looking at the people here today, if you happen to have anger issues, I don't recommend anger management courses. They're useless. I will recommend you find a shrink and dump it on her. <laughs> okay? Uh, it's much more effective. Okay? Uh, they have someone you can dump on. Okay? That's what anger is for. And that's how you release anger. Okay? Uh, better that. Better, better is better to dump it on your shrink, your therapist, than on your husband. Or anyone else, for that matter. Okay? Uh, all right. Uh, and uh, so what does he do? Uh, how did he become enlightened? He become enlightened by encountering the turning of the wheel of the perfect teaching each time a Buddha appears in the world. Here's what happens. Look at us. We are the down and out of luck kind of people. The Buddha is gone and we're picking up after the pieces. We listen to, you know, teachings of his disciples. My God. <laughs> You know, it's like no comparison. It's like it's like um, uh, it's like eating from at McDonald's versus eating a three-star Michelin restaurant. You know, listen to the, the Buddha is turning a Dharma wheel. It's like going to a three-star Michelin restaurant, and listening to me is like going to a uh, 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 subway. <laughs> it's not even McDonald's. <laughs> Okay, and so this is why, this is why uh, this tells you the difference between this celestial king, contentment, and us. He has so many blessings that he made sure that every time the Buddha appears in the world, 
What does he do? He says, encountering the turning of the wheel of perfect teaching. Meaning what? Same thing you're doing. <coughs> uh, he goes to Dharma lecture. Exactly. Thank you very much, number one. You are my number one. <laughs> exactly what you're doing, what number one is doing. When I'm out of time, he doesn't show up. <laughs> okay, so, so, so he, he, he grabbed the microphone right away. He knew what, exactly what it's about. What he does is that the nature, his blessings is that every time a Buddha appears in the world, okay, he would come and listen to the lecture of the perfect teaching. What is the perfect teaching? Well, it depends on who you ask. Okay? Mm. It's between the Lotus Sutra, which teaches you about you can become a Buddha. Before that, the Buddha says, oh, you're special. What? Okay, so the Buddha was very, very like a salesman before. They said, you're so special, you're so special. And then, and, and then when he gets to the Lotus Sutra, he says, you can be just like me. Let me tell you, just between us girls, okay? We are no different. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, the, uh, the perfect teaching, that period, or the Avatamsaka Sutra, which is a little bit more advanced, uh, complete teaching. All right? So what it means is that this king here is very selective. He doesn't go to Jack in the Box. Is there a three-star restaurant, Michelin restaurant around here in Los Angeles? I can't think of one. Hmm? In NorCal, you go to the French Laundry. Yeah, yeah. It's year after year after year, it's three-star restaurant. To the point where they said, we don't want to rate you anymore because you want to give others a chance to be get on the list. You're always like above the list. Any three-star restaurant, huh? Silver hair, still looking. Okay, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so not just the great vehicle sutra, but the perfect teaching is refers to the advanced teachings of Buddha in Mahayana. Okay, okay. Next, five fourteen. Celestial king, happiness like an ocean and a cow. Gain a pass in passage into liberation of obtaining the pure, bright body that pervades space. Shila Hai Chi Tian Wang, De Jing Shu Kong Jie, Qing Jing Guang Ming Shen Jie Tuo Men. All right. Okay. Uh, uh, so. Uh, what is this uh, celestial king happiness like an ocean and a cow? I don't know why it would be happy like an ocean and a cow. I don't get it. Huh? And like a cow is like, like a crown, if you will. The bodhisattvas, they have, a, they have a cow on top. It's like a crown. So instead of wearing a crown like, like the emperors, they wear a, a cow, okay? Uh, and an ocean. The ocean far, okay. Uh, so anyway, so he's very happy. Uh, he he's happy and uh, is as inexhaustible as the ocean, okay. Yes, eight. Any three star restaurant in Los Angeles? No. No. San San Diego. That's the only one. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> She's going there this afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> some, some of us have all the luck in the yeah. world. Addison. What, what is that called? Addison. Addison? What, what kind of food is that? A-D-D-I-S-O-N. What kind of food is that? What kind of food is it? 
French new French fair. French fusion. Upscale destination. Wow. So it's like in San Diego, folks, of those you, those of you who are, don't, are not familiar with San Diego, San Diego is like a feast and famine. Either you go to a three-star restaurant, there's nothing else in between. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. <laughs> it's so weird. <laughs> so how can I make a living there? <laughs> <laughs> yes, go forest. Hello, Master. Uh, I was just looking up uh, Master Xuanhua's explanation of the this uh, heavenly uh, king. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Master Xuanhua said because um, he's very joyful and happy, has no afflictions, and his mind is as wide as the ocean, his intention is as pure as the jeweled cow. So that's what the name comes from. His happiness as vast as the ocean. His is... mind is as vast as the ocean. Uh -huh. His intention is as pure as the jeweled cow. Okay, he must know what he's talking about. I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Why would uh, his intention as pure as a jeweled cow? Yeah, C-O-W-O, not a cow, like in, in Buffalo, <laughs> like beefsteak. The beefsteak, is it male or female? I'm curious. You steak aficionado, aficionados, huh? you don't know? It's no, there must be a difference, no? Usually the males, the... the the, the meat is, is, uh, is, uh, is not as, uh, as um, tender, no? Especially when they work out. <laughs> yes, five. Thank you, Master. Uh, I, I don't discriminate. <laughs> I'm happy for either a male or female beefsteak. I'll take either. What about... Tender or not, or not tender steaks. Do you yeah, as long as it's medium rare, as you know, it's the way to go. So. Okay, so American. <laughs> it's an interesting. Pure. The intention is pure as a cow. That's the first time I heard of it. It's interesting. You learn so much. Yes, six. Uh, Master, I, I hope I'm keeping up with this conversation. Can't hear too well anymore. Oh. Uh, what happened to hearing aids? Uh, I have hearing aids, but they're not working. They're not doing their job. Well, uh, time to have an annual checkup. Yes, I, uh, I intend to mm. very quickly. Mm. Anyway, getting back to uh, why a jeweled cow. Yes, sir. Isn't it obvious that the cow is the most sacred animal in all of <laughs> India? <laughs> Oh, you joking? Are you joking? <laughs> Are you comparing the cow of the Bodhisattva to an animal <laughs> in India? <laughs> what? <laughs> cow. Here, right here, on on the screen. Oh, okay. Okay, okay, but continue, continue, continue your chain of thought, <laughs> your pure chain of thought. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, five. Thank, thank you, Master Brady. That was very on point. Um, <laughs> Master, isn't if it were a jeweled cow, I could understand that a cow can have intentions. You know, like I want to eat grass today. Remember I see. That? That's okay. my intention. I see. But, but isn't a isn't a cow? Uh, apologies if I don't understand correctly. Isn't it, it like an inanimate object? How can it have intention? You see, I uh, uh, it's a, that's I'm I'm glad you asked because it, it's where I'm trying to go next. Is that uh, it's about happiness that's like a cow, not intention like a cow. 
You see, I don't know how Master Shen Hua went from happiness like an ocean, like a cow, into intention like a cow, pure intention like a cow. That's a, quite a step up. I don't get it. I can see happiness like an ocean. It's so vast, so pervasive, so endless, so profound. I can see that as a happiness. Okay? Mm. And when you practice Chan, okay, it's like that. It's incredible. You will experience it, let me assure you. It's a matter of time. It's fantastic. Okay? But a cow? <laughs> happiness like a cow? You know, I'm seeing steaks, you know, happiness like a cow, yeah. But not as a cow. <laughs> yes, GF. Uh, I don't think uh, it was saying the cow has intention. It was just saying the cow is pure. So the intention is pure. Yeah, but I'm talking about king happiness like a cow. <laughs> You see my problem? Is it, there's a disconnect somewhere between happiness and pure. Okay? Anyway, uh, we don't have to understand everything. Who cares? <laughs> okay? <laughs> we try our best. Huh? Okay? Uh, so he became enlightened by doing what? By obtaining a pure, bright body that pervades space. Meaning what? He's talking about the Dharma body, okay? And so, uh, so what he uh, did is when he, when he was meditating, his goal is, I want to achieve this Dharma body of the Buddha. And when you achieve the Dharma body of Buddha, your body is as vast as space, okay? Much bigger than the ocean, okay, or cow, okay? and it emits light. All right? So what does it mean? This is a clue for you, by the way. This is so typical of the Bodhisattvas, Mahasattvas. Okay? When they talk about a Dharma body, he's a Mahasattva. Okay? That's when they talk about Dharma bodies. Below that, you know, like the other, you know, they... Nowhere near that Dharma body that uh, he's referring to. So this is a typical of the Bodhisattva. He's so huge. He's a Mahasattva, big, big Mahasattva. And yet he manifests himself as a ruler of the heavens only. Okay, okay? That's so Mahasattva-like. 6516, Celestial King, banner of supreme merit and virtue, gain a passage into liberation of making an ocean of pure vows that dispels the world's sufferings. 最圣功德床天王, 得消灭世间苦, All right. Commentary slide 517. Hmm. So his name is, who he is now, who, uh, who is he known for? Supreme merit and virtue, okay? And it's so supreme, it's so, it is so, uh, uh, so impressive that it is as, uh, so well known that it's like a banner of merit and virtue. What is merit and virtue? So supreme merit and virtue is that because now, after he became enlightened, what he does is to generate tremendous merit and virtues. That's what he does after he became enlightened. Okay, okay? Okay? And how did he become enlightened? By making an ocean of pure vows, okay, that dispels the world's sufferings. First of all, the world is full of sufferings. Yes? It's boundless sufferings in the world. 
Okay? And so look at his, the scope of his, 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 uh, his vision, his vows. Okay? He says, the world, I see the suffering in the world. Okay? I want to dispel all those sufferings, not just only for Southern California, only for uh, 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 San Diego. There you go. Thank you. Who has a three-star restaurant? <laughs> okay. And we don't? Seriously? Los Angeles has no culture whatsoever? <laughs> hmm. You know, because food is like part of the culture. Food reflects our culture. So meaning that LA has no culture whatsoever. Uh, never mind. Okay. Mm. We work on that. Okay. So he sees. So he's, he's very compassionate. He sees the world's sufferings. And when he sees the world's sufferings, does he choose to ignore them? No. He says, because I see these sufferings, I made a vow. Okay? Not just a vow, but tons of vows, as many as the ocean, as countless as the ocean, as profound as the ocean. All right? So the number is dizzy kinds of vows that he made. Why? Because... Each type of suffering requires a different kind of vow, maybe, to resolve the suffering. Okay? The sufferings are endless, and therefore the vows are so endless. It's so cool. Talking about compassion. Huh? I want you to think about it. This is so important. These people are there because they are no ordinary people. They... The vision uh, is humongous. They are not content with helping, let's say, you know, their own kinds. Okay? Like Americans. Okay? Or Asians. But they want to help the entire world. Okay? Yes, nine. Nuevo. Oh, thank you, Master. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just thinking because it, it seemed kind of disconnected vows and world suffering, but I mean, the vow, the vow implies like action, right? And helping and getting on the ground and, and resolving all of these problems. Yes. So the vows have to do with I see the world suffering. For example, I see that LA has no three star restaurant. So I vow to make more than two. <laughs> because LA must be suffering so much. <laughs> All right? So, so the vows are designed to, to provide relief for the suffering and uh, destroy the sufferings. Okay? Finally, what's a pure vow? Anyone? You know what a pure vow is? Jing Yuan. What's pure vow? Yes. Uh, is that now, is that, let me see, is that a sparrow? Hummingbird? Oh, thank you. Yeah, it does look like a hummingbird. But the hummingbird I saw usually blue in, in, at the temples. Or dark gray, charcoal gray. Toyota's charcoal gray. I really don't know. Never mind. Okay. Um, I think a pure vow is probably a vow that's in line with the, uh, the Dharma. In line with the Dharma. Why does it simply say Dharma vows? But why does he choose pure vows? Hmm? What's a pure vow? Hmm? 
Anyone knows what's a pure vow? Five. Thank you, Master. I don't know what a pure vow is, but when I encounter this term, perhaps it is uh, a vow that is made uh, by someone without ego, without self, without uh, benefit to themselves, only to benefit others. Hmm. Okay. Uh, let's go to k -Land. GMT. What's a pure vow? Let's wake them up. I mean, we see all those four nuns there and a monk there sitting there. I want to see if they have been listening. <laughs> What's a pure vow? You didn't learn that in Sangha school? What about on the men's side? You know what a pure vow is? They don't. Okay, go to JC. Well, do you know what a pure... Oh, go ahead, go ahead. XE, what's a pure vow? Can't hear you. Enlightened person made a vow. That is the pure vow. Mm, not bad. What about JC? JC. This distinction there you have to be aware of. Okay? Uh, this is why we're discussing this. Anyone at JC would like to say, what is a pure vow? Meaning, are you pure, JC? You make pure vows at JC or not? Yeah? Anyone? You cultivate at JC. <laughs> Why are you so quiet? Ah, now I'm worried. You guys cultivate at JC. You know what pure vow is? No? Okay, I spare you. It's early in the morning for them. Okay. A pure vow, as you heard it, Okay, a pure vow is a vow that is... Go ahead, DTT. I'm glad DTT stopped me before I give the feel. <laughs> Hello, Master. Hello. Hola. Hola. Uh, well, Master, first of all, I want to thank you for allowing me to be here mm. in the and to cultivate. Mm -hmm. uh, also, thank you to Master C and all the Sangha. And mm, yeah. Thank you're, you very much. You're welcome. Uh, thank, thank you for coming to cultivate with us. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Master. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, okay, I think a pure vow is like the, um, maybe it's not one, but I think it's like the great vows like uh, that Bodhisattva do. Mm -hmm. Like the 10 gra great vows of Bodhisattva. All right. Mm, those are like the pure vows. Okay. Let me ask you, just for the, I'm just curious, okay? Uh, did you ever make vows yourself? What? Have you made any vows? in the past, um, before, before coming to the temple? Did you make any vows? Yes. What can we hear one vow? Yeah, for example, uh, not, no, don't kill. 
that's not a vow. <laughs> I'm more like, I'm going to kill you. It's more like a vow. <laughs> Are you sure? Aren't you confused about vows and non-vows? You see, the movies I watch, when they say, I vow I will make you pay, that, that will shed your blood. That's a typical vow, no? No? Where are you from? Wait a Mexico? <laughs> Wait a minute. What do, you, what do Mexicans, what kind of vow you guys make over there? Here in America, I said, I will kill you. I vow to kill you. I vow to make you pay. Yeah, sounds familiar? Yeah? Yeah, I vow for my revenge. I will have my revenge. That's a typical vow, yes? What, do, what kind of vows do you guys make in Mexico City? Uh, Mexico, near Mexico City? She doesn't know. No, maybe I don't understand. You don't understand? Uh, 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 someone translate for her. Sin <laughs> XS2. Explain to her. Translate for her. El maestro te pregunta que qué tipo de voto cuando haces un voto haces un voto por ejemplo decir te voy a matar voy o prometo una venganza de ti no no voy a decir no no voy a matar only at our media empire. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got it? You understand? No. No. <laughs> okay, XS2, you fired. <laughs> no, it's because I can hear a uh, venerable XX very good. I think I am, my hearing is not very good. Sorry. But I don't understand also venerable XX. Sorry. One more time, XS2. That's the last, your last chance. Bueno, el maestro se está, se está refiriendo a que eh, en la vida diaria, cuando haces un voto, es una promesa de algo que tienes que hacer. El, lo normal en Estados Unidos es que cuando prometes algo, sea algo, algo malo, es decir, o te voy a matar o voy a vengarme de ti. Eso es a lo que se refiere, a un voto así normal en la vida diaria. Entonces te pregunta que en México qué es lo que suele hacer votos la gente, qué es lo que suele prometer cuando dice voy a hacer esto, voy a hacer lo otro. ¿Qué tipo de promesas hacéis? ¿Entiendes ahora? Ah, ok, ya, ya entendí, sí. No, no, it, it doesn't sound the same like the first time. <laughs> It's a lot longer. <laughs> ok, you got it? Ok, so what kind of vow did you make? She, she has to think. The Mexicans, I'm, yeah. I'm thinking that they're different, aren't they? <laughs> uh, maybe like I will be like better than you, like have more money than you. I yeah, vow. there you go. There you go. That's a typical Mexican vow. <laughs> okay, okay. okay, thank you. Very good. Okay, how about JC? What's the answer for JC? Because there's a wisdom, they no longer looks at any defilement. Mm, look at any defilement. impure thing. That's correct. It's also correct. Okay. What Pure vows means is that you heard it, okay? The first requirement is that you make a vow that is not self-benefiting. It's not about benefiting yourself, okay? Ordinary people, when they make a vow, okay, then it's to benefit themselves, to serve themselves. Pure vows are free from that defilement. The vows that are self-serving are defiled, 
are unclean. Okay? So the vows that are, if you're not enlightened yet, you need some help from a good new advisor to correct you so that your vows are not self-serving. Is that clear? Finally, I understand why Master Shenhua said, you tell me what your vows are, I help you correct your vows. Because when you don't have wisdom, your vows tend to be self-serving. Sounds good? So it requires wisdom for you to make the proper vows. Okay? So that's, that's the minimum level. So we're talking about if you don't have a good no advisor, then you need to be able to become enlightened before you can make vows. Because as long as you're not enlightened, everything you do is about serving yourself. Like it or not. You say, but I'm a nice person, a good person. Yeah, but you are still self-serving. That's the bottom line. So any vows you make until you become enlightened is all self-serving. And we talk about enlightenment here is minimum fourth stage aha. Because below that, you're still self-serving. That's why from first stage aha to third stage aha, it has, it's called positions of studies with studies, meaning they still have to learn how to get rid of the ego. We need to learn to how to get rid of the ego. Yes, nine. Uh, thank you, Master. I was curious, uh, it, does a pure vow necessarily, ha uh, is it necessarily markless? That's the next level. Okay. And so, so first of all, the pure vows, you can say pure vows because, because it's not self-serving. So therefore, I need to, to em uh, emphasize this. If your vows have any, it even has a trace of self-serving, then it's not pure. Okay? And therefore, the bottom line is that whatever you say, until you become enlightened, whatever you conceive up until you get fourth or higher, then it has a trace of self-serving in there. The ego still sneaks in, has a way to sneak in. No two ways about it. There's nothing you can do. Okay? So know your limitations. So that's why when you're below fourth stage of heart, go find someone who's higher than you to fourth or higher, and then they help you produce or create the proper vows. So far, so good? Next level, okay? When you become enlightened, at the next level of big enlightenment, okay, then your vows uh, are made when uh, that originates from the nature, and no longer from a thinking mind, then it's pure. Is of the utmost purity, highest grade of vows, the purest, are from those people up there. Okay, so what happened is that for him, here's my, here's my, my interpretation, for him, okay, he started making vows when he was cultivating like us right now. And then his good no advice is, okay, no, 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 change his vow to that, change his vow to that. And then so he kept on making vows and vows and vows. So his vows get bigger and bigger and purer and bigger and purer and bigger and purer. That's his Dharma door. You know, Master Shinoha has something like 18 vows that he made. He said, I want to save, uh, I want to save everyone who, who, who hurt my name. I, like, I will wait for them to become a Buddha before I become a Buddha. I want to, um, to uh, save everyone who has seen my image. Okay? And I will not become a Buddha until they become a Buddha. That's another vow. You see that? Yeah. It sounds like I, but actually it's no I there. Okay? And then I make a vow to save all four stage arhats. I will not become a Buddha until they become Buddhas. You know how many four stage arhats there are? Many of you are four stage arhats. He will have to save you before he becomes a Buddha. <laughs> 
You know, cool? Just get the fourth stage ahad, and then you say, okay, Master Shiva, your turn. <laughs> okay? Uh, all right. And so he had, he made 18 vows. And so, so, so that's why these vows get bigger and purer as your levels increase. Okay? And so that's why he made an ocean of pure vows. So this is, this is the point here. After he became enlightened, okay, for Sage Jahat, he started making more vows and more vows and more vows. That's why eventually they become ocean of pure vows. And fascinating. They're not content with only saving, you know, pale faces. They want to save black faces, red faces, yellow faces, you know, green faces, <laughs> leprechauns. <laughs> you have a problem with that, huh? <laughs> anyway, you see, so that's why they get bigger and bigger. It's fascinating. And that's how he became enlightened. You make vows and big vows. That's how he made it to Mahasattva level. Okay. Uh -huh. 518. Celestial King, quiescent and light, gain a passage into liberation of manifesting a body everywhere to speak the Dharma. Okay, commentary. Okay, remember, this is heaven of contentment. He's very happy. Okay, and it's funny that how does being there, okay, uh, 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 and in the heaven of, of, uh, of uh, contentment, and he still continues to create supreme merit and virtue. Isn't that interesting? Huh? And now this next guy here, okay? Quiescent light, meaning that now that he's enlightened, he's in constant samadhi and emits lights. All right? Uh, so, meaning what? When you're in samadhi, that's quiescent, okay? You're happier. You're so happy. Okay, yeah. and, and because, so this quiescent here uh, is his state of happiness, quiet happiness. Okay, and light here uh, is the natural light of wisdom that he emits when he's in that samadhi. So far, so good. Mm. And so, how did he become enlightened? Okay, uh, by doing two things, acquiring two skills. That's how he became a Mahasattva. He became Mahasattva by learning to speak the Dharma or turn the Dharma wheel. Okay, meaning that he speaks Dharma for the lowly as well for the high levels. So far, so good. It doesn't say, I'm going to speak Dharma, the Four Noble Truths, for you. Depending on who you are, he speaks you in the Four Noble Truths, he speaks the Prasya Dharma, he teaches you about Lotus Dharma, he teaches you about Avatamsaka uh, Dharma, and so forth. So he has a full spectrum. He's so knowledgeable about the Dharma itself. Okay? And let me assure you, He's so knowledgeable about the Tripitaka that he doesn't bother doing what? Getting a PhD in Buddhology. It's so insulting. You know what I mean? Can you see yourself and become your turn? Okay, G.I. Joe. You become a Mahasattva who knows the Tripitaka. 
Sir, put yourself, imagine yourself a, as someone who understands the Buddha Dharma thoroughly, a Tripitaka expert. Would you bother going and get a PhD from someone to certify you? If they want to certify you, they have to be the same or better than you. Yeah? Yes, go ahead, six. I wouldn't uh, think it would be necessary. Ah, precisely. That's why I'm baffled. Why would anyone who wants to learn the Buddha Dharma would go to a university to get certified? I don't get it. Yes, eight. Thank you, Master. Um, we have a, a question here from Diego Alfonso. Yes. Amitafo master, master. Shall we call it San Diego? <laughs> Diego. <laughs> Amitafo Master, how can we start preparing ourselves in this moment in order to be able to speak Dharma in the future? I don't know. What do you think? Speaking Dharma here requires, that's what we've been doing. Before you, you speak the Dharma, or I ask you to speak the Dharma, I want to train you in samadhi. First, you develop your samadhi. And then, uh, when samadhi is high enough, then you'll be able to penetrate the Buddha's teachings. Speaking Dharma here doesn't refer to breath alone, but also death. Scholars have the breath of the Dharma. They read a lot, they publish a lot but they don't have the death of the Dharma. Mahayana is both breath and profound, it's so profound, death, inconceivable death and breath. Okay, look, the Avatamsaka Sutra that we're studying right now, the one version we're studying is a short version. Okay, a uh, tiny version, if you will. The long version is endless. So if you want, you as a human being, want to become an expert in Avatamsaka Sutra, and you can read, start reading a long version, and you'll never be able to finish it. Never. So how can you ever expect to be able to understand the Avatamsaka Sutra? So why would you go, why would we only give you a short version? Because you are stupid. I mean, I mean, we are stupid. <laughs> you cannot read the long version. So we have to give you the short version. Okay? And if we give you only a short version and we are not careful, you look, look at the ver short version and say, oh, I'm an expert in Avatamsaka Sutra. No, you're not. You only have, you know, you're reading, you, you only know about one grain of sand in the Ganges River. And you cannot possibly be the Ganges River. Yes? And so, that's why, in order for you to understand the Avatamsaka Sutra before you can explain it, you have to, what? Develop samadhi power. Because with samadhi, you can extrapolate. You hear one, you understand 10, understand 1,000, understand 10,000, understand 100,000. 
and so on and so on. That's the function of samadhi. You see, that's how we train our people in the Buddha Dharma. It's not about degrees. It's not about volume. It's about the combination of precepts, samadhi, and wisdom. You name any professor who has those three, then I would like to, I would seek their certification. You don't have it, you're not qualified to certify me. Okay, okay. Oh. So to speak the Dharma requires you uh, to have incredible samadhi and wisdom. So far so good. So to answer San Diego's question earlier, that's what we've been doing with you. The foundation, first things first, you learn to develop your samadhi. So our program is geared towards uh, developing those abilities for you. Why is that? Because, because when you have wisdom, uh, you unfold wisdom, uh, we, wish, you know, we will reach a certain point in time when we are you're considered, considered to have transcendental wisdom, meaning first stage ahat or higher, then you have transcendental wisdom. I don't call it enlightenment yet. I call it transcendental wisdom. Okay? Then uh, you can speak Dharma. Because you, your soul has been liberated. Yeah? Hmm. All right. So the first thing for this guy does in order, did, in order to become enlightened, is to understand uh, the importance of speaking the Dharma. Because that creates incredible blessings. If you know how to speak the Dharma, you generate incomparable blessings. And how, what is meant by if you can speak the Dharma? When I talk about can, being able to speak the Dharma is not about how many sutras you understand, how or oh, your, your, the scope of your, you know, oh, your types of, uh, of uh, reading, is it sutras, is it shashas, and so forth, okay? What I'm talking about speaking the Dharma here refers to uh, knowing which Dharma you should speak for which people. Because when the Buddha turned the Dharma wheel is to help uh, liberate people. That's why you speak the Dharma and the result of which is to help uh, the listeners end their suffering, attain bliss, and obtain liberation. That's what speaking the Dharma means. It's not like, oh, you know, uh, let me tell you uh, the first uh, chapter of Avatamsaka Sutra, and you're basically like regurgitating someone else's words. It's called pleasureism. Okay? Yes, eight. Thank you, Master. Um, we have a question from Ru Z, that's R U Z H I. How and when can I make a vow? Will it be after I become an arhat? No, you can make vow now. That's a good question. You can start making vows, very much like when you became, when you take refuge in, uh, in the uh, Buddhist ceremony, okay, mm. you are beginning, you're learning about the Dharma, making vows already. For example, when you take refuge with us in a ceremony in liturgy, after you a bit confer the Buddhist substance from your master, okay, then we ask you to make four vast vows, okay, 
Okay, what are the four vast vows? First vow is living beings, a countless, I vow to save them all. Yeah? What second vow? Anyone remembers? Seriously? You Buddhists, you look and you consider yourself yourself to be Buddhists? Yes, nine. Second vow. I kept vow to cut off all afflictions. The afflictions are endless. I vow to cut them all. end them all. What's the third vow? Very good. Okay. Go ahead, nine. I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> Um, I vow to study the limitless Dharma doers. I like her. <laughs> this is why we cannot ignore people from San Diego. <laughs> uh, well, uh, the Dharma doers are uh, are. Uh, Phạm Anh Vũ Liêng are huh? limitless. Uh, limitless. Okay, I vow to learn them all. What's the fourth one? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I vow to attain the supreme Buddhist wisdom. Ninety-nine percent. <laughs> Excellent. Phổ Tao Vũ Sang. The Buddha's ways is unsurpassed. I vow to realize it. All those are the four vast vows that we all make. And every time you encounter the Dharma again, next lifetime, okay? Would be a long, long time from now, let me assure you. I ain't gonna get to see you that often, that soon. Trust me. Unless you go to the Pure Land, I see you there. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, how do I know if I made vows in the past life? How do you know? Yeah. If you didn't make vows, how do you think you are able to sit here? Is it important to know what vows I made? It's too many. Who cares? It's like, remember, this ocean, ocean of vows? Look at this guy. The ocean of pure vows. Then how am I you can't possibly remember everything. It's an ocean. How am you I count the water in the ocean? How am I able to keep a vow if I can't remember what it is? Well, it's, when, let's say you make a vow that you're going to save, uh, I don't know, uh, make a vow. What, who do you want to save? Uh, my mom. Okay, why don't we save my mom? Okay, here's what happens. You made a vow to save your mom. Which mom? <laughs> <laughs> this mom, right? Okay, let's be specific. <laughs> you, you vow to save this mom. Okay, and then and then uh, in time, next lifetime, you forget. You will forget. For sure. Okay? But what happened is that once you made a vow, there's a seed in your eighth consciousness. It says, I vow to save this woman, this person, this, this living being, so that next lifetime, okay, when the opportunity presents itself, somehow, that seed is activated. And you remember. You may not remember, you made a vow to save her, but somehow you do things to help her and push her up, you know, climb up, climb up. You know. So it's not the way you think, like, I must remember before I do it. No, it's just like this, when you make a vow, this is a secret, Buddhist secret. Okay, don't tell others. Buddhist secret. Your vow is like, 
this incredible energy, this force, a Jedi force. Yeah, and then that force is what empowers you, somehow draws you and, and, and pushes you to help that person, to make it come true. That's point number one. Okay, because it's energy. Vow is real energy that never dies, by the way. Okay? So the vow is like an energy right there. Okay? So it's, it's there, and if when condition arises, it, it will be activated. And, and naturally, you certainly, you will, somehow, you are, you are drawn to helping that person. You don't know why. And after you became enlightened, they said, oh, that woman used to be my mother. Now she's my slave. It happens. Okay? So that's why people ask, why do you, why, why do you, help, why do you just, uh, help that slave of yours? Don't you know? It used to be my dad. Okay? That's point number one. So there's a force, this energy that it sort of compels you to help this person to fulfill your vow. That's why vows are power. That's why it's called vow power. You realize that? It's for real. Think about it. When for Mexico lady who says, I vow to become richer than, uh, than that person, it's, it actually drives her. She has more drive to work harder, to make more sacrifices. Am I correct? That's what happens to all of us. The, the people who became rich, the tycoons are the ones who made vows. I'm going to be a tycoon. I want to be a tycoon. So you see, that's a vow. And so you, it, you, you can draw upon your vow power. That's number one. Okay? Number two. If your vow happened to be Buddhist, meaning meets Buddhist criteria as a good Buddhist vow, okay? In particular, when you are smart, you make a Buddhist vow in front of. Why do you think during the three refuges, what did we do? Anyone remember? First thing we did? It is so Buddhist, it's so clever. What? How many refuge ceremonies have you attended? We have at least like a few each year. One. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. During these Buddhist ceremonies, what do we do? We invite the Buddhas and the sages to come to certify the ceremony. And then what do we do next? He said, make the vows. Did you vow to not kill? Yeah, I vow not to kill until the, end, until the end of my life. Until the end of my life, I vow not to kill. Okay, number two. You vow not to steal. Until the end of my life, I vow not to steal. Yes, I do. Yes, I can. And what, what do you think is happening? You make the vow in front of them. So why? Oh, this is all Buddhist. We help you in so subtle ways that you, you know, you say, yeah, so what's a big deal? Now, now you know, you may want to attend more than one refuge ceremony, man. Okay? You made a vow in front of them. They came to certify the ceremony. So you said, when you said, I vow to the end of my life not to kill, not to steal, and so forth, right? They said, oh, good boy. That's the girl. So be because of that, you made a vow in front of them. Guess what? They will help you. Invisibly. 
it will help you fulfill your vows. That's, you get help. The vow power comes not only from your mind, also from the Buddha's assistance as well. Isn't that cool? That's why in Mahayana, we make vows. Lots of vows. Endless vows. Like this guy. But his vows here are based on developing his compassion. When you make a vow to relieve all the suffering, your compassion, your mind of compassion, heart of compassion grows bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. That's how he became a Mahasattva, because his compassion grew and grew and grew and grew. That's his trade secret, how he became a Mahasattva. Yes, eight. Thank you, Master. Uh, Diego has another question. Amitabha, Master, how about the bad vows we have made in the past? How can we stop those seeds from sprouting? Kind of late, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, if we, can we call the presence of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas for help or? Not really. And the truth of the matter is, I never made any bad vows. So I don't, I'm at a loss. I don't know what to do with bad vows. I mean, who would make a bad vow? Come on. Well, Be reasonable. My question is, what is a bad vow? Yes, impure vow. Oh, well. A bad vow is like hurting someone. Like, I'm going to kill you. I, you know, like someone, like in the movies, they go in and they kill your family. You know, I vow to have my revenge. Okay, that's a bad vow. The better vow would be, Buddha, please help me revenge. <laughs> no? <laughs> See, now you're learning to be smarter. <laughs> Never mind. Don't quote me, okay? <laughs> yes, uh, the man in the back. Sir, what, what about a vow that we wanted to be with the person life after life when we make the vow, when we do the wedding? What oh, should we do about it? Boy, are you in trouble? <laughs> Don't ever do that. <laughs> the good thing about it is that no one really means it. <laughs> in particular, in particular, it's like a, something that you choose when you, when you, when do, when you call, you ask the father, the minister. To, uh, to administer the, the ceremony for you. And he says, what, what do you choose? He said, you know, and, and so he gave you some, some choices and you choose that section. And you, you can say it's from the, from the priest, it's not from my heart. <laughs> Until death do us part. Do Buddhists make the kind of vow? No, we don't. <laughs> we know better. <laughs> uh, seriously, uh, Asian ladies, please help us out. When you got married, <laughs> did you make a vow to, to death, uh, do us part or something? Do, did you or not? Did you? <laughs> but you Catholic. That's a Catholic vow. No, I'm talking about Buddhists. I mean, Master, at the wedding day, yeah, I'm sincere. Yeah, I 
Sakti. <laughs> And that's from a Buddhist monk or, or what? Because if, I, if you ask me to, to do the, the wedding thing for you, I would never ask you to do that. Never. Not Buddhist monk. I would say, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, yes, nine. Master, I have a funny story. I went to a Jewish wedding one time. Uh -huh. And their vows are actually, and I vow to be with you in this life and the next. And the next. And when, they, when the um, rabbi said that, uh -huh. you could hear the father in law in the background going, Well, that's a little much, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that's sad. <laughs> Father knows best, yes, okay. <laughs> yes, sir. What do Mexicans uh, uh, vow, make a vow? I'm going to ask to go to DTT and ask a Mexican lady what, what vow you, they make over there. <laughs> yes, one. Oh. I, I said it's only two lives, though. It's only two lives. It's not that bad. No. Jewish. This life and the next one, that's too much. No, lives. no, no. No, I, I give you a better, uh, better approach. And that's ask a Mexican lady in DTT. What kind of vows, Patricia, what, do you make, what kind of vows did you make when you got married? Um, well, fortunately, I'm not married. <laughs> and does it sound like she will make vows when she, she marries? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I think, uh, yeah, it's about like kind of a, I will vow to be with you in wealth and um, in sickness and health yeah. and sickness for yeah, all yeah, my yeah. life. Okay, yeah, for, 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 uh, for richer, for poorer, in health, in sickness. Like in any, in any situation, they vow to be together. How romantic. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> but, but don't ever make a vow to be together forever, okay? No, no. Okay, there you go. Okay, now we're safe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. Um, regarding... Uh, making vows a second lifetime, this lifetime, next lifetime, is still doable. Next lifetime, go to the Pure Land together. Yeah? Hallelujah, she says. See? That would be a good vow. I said, this here will be together, but next lifetime, We'll be together in the Pure Land. Where do I begin? <laughs> okay, anyone else? Uh, who says Avatamsaka Sutra is boring? You guys make it so... <laughs> Okay, 518. One more slide and we... Uh, oh yeah. Celestial King, Quest and Light. What? Did we do that? No, no, we, we're not done yet. So you speak the Dharma, okay? And then he also manifests a body everywhere. So this is sort of the drive for him. He says, I'm going to develop the ability to appear anywhere. Okay, I will appear in Mexico City to speak Dharma and then ask XS2 to translate. Okay, I will manifest myself in, at JC and ask XF to translate, that kind of thing. Okay, so, so this, this is called spiritual power. It's called Shen Zhu Tong. Okay, meaning the spiritual foot. So he's developing 
His vow is that I will develop the ability to be here and then one drop of a hat, disappear here from here into the earth and then appear in Paris and buy some long comb. And speak Dharma for the sales girl. Oh. <laughs> okay. Parlez-vous français? <laughs> All right. Isn't that cool? So I would choose that as part of my drills before I would manifest a body everywhere to speak the Dharma. So first we develop the ability to go, to f go anywhere we feel like, shopping, trying, you know, San Diego, and so forth, okay? It's that, it's that two-stage process. You see that? You learn to speak the Dharma, and then you learn to develop the, the abilities to manifest everywhere. So that's why his level is extremely high, because he says, I want to go everywhere in the universe. See how powerful he is. And he doesn't need to ride SpaceX to go up there in the heavens. He's poof, just like that. Isn't that fascinating? That's a different world, isn't it? We are so, you know, say, uh, would you like to go so, uh, go, 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 go eat something? So, you know, it's rush hour traffic. You know, too far away. With the spiritual penetration, distance is no longer a problem. Mm, cool? Okay. That's a world of enlightenment for you. Don't tell me that cultivation is boring. It is so interesting, let me tell you. Yeah? I want you to be exposed to this world here where it's actually fun. It's not just like, oh, master makes me cross my legs and hurt so much. It's only a test, a small test. Okay, but great fun is around the corner. Well, soon, I hope. All right? Sounds good? See, everyone's so happy. Rah, rah, yeah? <laughs> okay, go, Buddhism. I mean, Mahayana. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's not enough time to, for us to continue, so we stop here today. Thank you all very much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Rebirth transference to help these uh, poor souls go to the pure land. Yeah?